Welcome everyone to the last seminar of the CBCS. No, it's not true. There is another one next week. But it's an extra one. There is an extra one next week, uh, thanks to Peter, so you can check that out on the website. And uh, today is David Terra from uh, Madrid, the UNED, UNED, I don't know how it's said. Uh, he's a professor in philosophy of medicine, uh, you would say that, yes. And he's going to present a joint work with Clara Uskanga. Ça c'est difficile, elle est basque. Do you understand? <laughs> Uskanga. Uskanga. Well, that's not so hard. And so what's evidence, what evidence for a cholera vaccine? Uh, Ferran submission, submission to the Prix Bréan. Uh, Merci, Juliette. So thanks so much, Juliette, for the invitation. Thanks so much to the audience. And as I was telling Juliette, I'm truly moved because my academic career started literally 25 years ago here in Luganlanef when I got a fellowship that allowed me to spend us the summer of 1998. I was an undergrad, I think then, um, at the Scherhuber uh, with Philippe Amparais, completely alone in a deserted Luganlanef. But I mean, it gave me a view of the world, my first view of the world. For instance, libraries. I mean, you could access the books here. I mean, freely. I mean, without. Uh, intermediation from the librarian. For us as parents, that was completely new. And there, were, there was the occasional seminar. And there were people at the shop who were working every single day of the week through the summer. And I thought, God, I mean, these people are crazy. But then I loved it. I mean, I, I loved it. And uh, the reason I, ac I accepted this seminar was completely egoistic. I wanted to come back. I wanted to see how it had changed. So thanks, Juliette. Thanks to the uh, audience. I'm truly happy to be here. I guess you're not so happy to have me here because even if Juliet said, look, a bit of history of science is always nice. I mean, an hour talk about an obscure physician who claimed he had invented a cholera vaccine, I mean, who would care about that? I mean, for an hour, on June, <laughs> end of the term. So I thought I must, I mean, do this. Um, Otherwise, I must present a paper that is potentially relevant for an interdisciplinary audience. And well, I mean, it's not so difficult because um, you see, when I started this paper with Clara, Clara was my former PhD student and that was her dissertation project. And I thought, well, a cholera vaccine, a controversy on a cholera vaccine in 19th century Spain. I mean, how interesting, how curious. I mean, this, when we finished uh, dissertation and then the paper, I thought this is the last time I hear anything about pandemics. <laughs> <laughs> and that was literally, I mean, the paper was literally submitted on January 2020. <laughs> 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 and I swear to God that I thought I'm done with this stuff. <laughs> but then, I mean, to my great surprise, uh, the, I mean, the world became like Clara's thesis. In debates, I had only found, I mean, in, as a curiosity for the antiquarian, became, I mean, our everyday uh, controversies in the, in the daily press. So, I mean, turn back to uh, March 2020. Remember, lockdown had started and we were assessing how good each lockdown policy was, counting deaths. So the more people you saved, the better your lockdown policy was. So every day we're having death counts, I mean, it was really depressing, on the media. Until, I mean, one of my favorite statisticians, David Spielhalter, came with this opinion piece in The Guardian and said, but look, I mean, we do not know how many people are dying of COVID uh, this quick, because there are many different statistical sources. These sources follow different criteria. We need to consolidate these sources. We need to check out the data. I mean, we need to perform all sorts of calculation, calculations, and these might take months, weeks, perhaps years. So use a different metric, please. And I thought, well, that's what I've been studying, because put yourselves in the following situation. Uh, imagine 100 years from now, and in 2123, Statisticians haven't yet agreed on how many people have died of COVID. Now, how would historians write the story of this episode? I mean, how can we uh, analyze a controversy which, for which we don't have 
consolidated data. That's the mental experiment. Now, think back a hundred years in the past. I mean, return to the end of the 19th century and you would find yourselves in uh, exactly the same situation. Here we have Jaime Ferran. He wrote Jaime, but Catalan historians call him Jaume. So that's the controversy. Uh, an independent scholar who uh, working at his home laboratory uh, near Barcelona by the end of the 19th century claimed he had invented a cholera vaccine and he tried it in a massive vaccination campaign. But still, I mean, historians do not agree on the quality of this vaccine. International historians consider him uh, a curiosity, I mean, someone who had this claim and tried this vaccine but for them, there was no evidence that it worked. Whereas in Spain, for most historians, I mean, the guy was a hero, a pioneer. I mean, he would have his, uh, more recognition that he got. So, who's right? That was the initial question for Clara uh, and me. Now, the first claim of the thesis that I will present here, and it's a claim that it's very mildly interesting for the non expert, is that we will never have the, the evidence that would allow us to settle the controversy. I mean, we cannot redo that vaccination campaign. We don't know how, vac how the vaccine was prepared. So we have no way to decide whether um, Ferran was right or wrong in his claim. But this sort of agnosticism puts the historian in a very complicated position because you have a void and you have to fill this void. So most historians, I mean, fill this void using a sort of what I call a, a narrative of biases. I mean, the controversy wasn't about the vaccine, but about nationalism. So French nationals protecting uh, their scientists, again, Spanish nationals protecting their own chauvinism scientific diplomacy. So if you go into the standard historiography of this period, uh, Sabini Charles isn't here because he's your 19th century expert, you would see that um, nationalism plays a role in narratives of uh, international controversies in medicine by the end of the 19th century. And we are going to claim here that uh, this shouldn't be so, that we, use and we shouldn't use the concept of bias so lightly in our historiographical uh, narratives. And in this regard, I'm taking uh, a position against the consensus uh, among historians of science. And that's what I thought would be a bit more interesting for you, uh, at least assuming that there were a couple of historians here who wanted to debate this with me. So what I'm going to do in the next like 25, 30 minutes, because I like to be brief, is that I'm going to present uh, the story I mean, quickly in the controversy and then uh, close it with uh, a few slides in which I try to show, I mean, what's the philosophy behind all this, the philosophy of the history of science. So that's the project. And if at some point you are bored, I mean, you can stop me and ask me about my year in Paris. And I promise <laughs> I can deliver wonderful stories which are much more entertaining than the talk I'm here. This is for the audience, in case. <laughs> I, you want to, 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 to make the audience of your following, you want to rise, rise, it's, uh, you have to choose. <laughs> okay, so who are we talking about here? So, Zhao Mao, Jaime Ferrani Clua, who was, like I said, a Catalan physician who studied medicine in Barcelona and was commissioned by the town hall to go to Mar Marseille in 1884 to find out, I mean, how they were trying to control um, the cholera outbreak they were having there. I mean, at that point, cholera was a very, very bad thing. I mean, like, it made people die by the thousands, although now you can perfectly imagine what it was like. So, there, uh, he discovered a few disciples of Pasteur, and with them he learned, I mean, how they tried to prepare vaccines. So, in those days in which there were no serious frontiers, he brought back some samples of cholera, I mean, <laughs> the standard thing to do, and he started tinkering at home with <laughs> with the <laughs> cultures, I mean, trying to see whether he could um, find a vaccine that he was trying on, on animals. And only a few months later, he announced publicly that he had got one. And in these times of desperation, I mean, he was immediately reclaimed the, 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 the following year. I mean, to try this ma vaccine in a, in a massive cholera outbreak that took place in Valencia, a coastal region. And he even, uh, and he reached, he, 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 
he he vaccinated apparently about some some fifty thousand people, which was unheard of. I mean, at that point, it was a, an achievement in itself. But unluckily for poor Ferran, I mean, and this won't surprise you either. I mean, the Spanish public opinion was immediately polarized uh, about his vaccine in political terms. Surprise. I mean, the liberals were for the vaccine, the conservatives were against the vaccine. And so we had the Ferranistas and the anti-Ferranistas. Now, unlikely for Ferran, the conservatives were in office, so they stopped the vaccination campaign. Uh, not before some international delegates had arrived in Valencia to see whether Ferran was really into something or not. Uh, and again, I mean, these people had uh, contradictory views. I mean, some uh, were for and thought that the vaccine was working, whereas others saw no evidence about it. So poor Ferran, imagine yourself, an independent scholar who had suddenly became, uh, uh, I know, a hero for part of the Spanish population, but didn't, uh, wasn't achieving enough scientific respect. He thought the best way to settle down this controversy is, again, invoke the authority of science, I mean, something we uh, saw as well during our COVID pandemic. At that point, the authority, the scientific authority on, vaccine, on cholera was the French Academy of Science. So the, this academy was awarding every year the so-called prix Briand. Uh, the prix Briand was uh, an incentive for an incentive prize for cholera research. You got it in full if you could cure, if you could prove you could cure or prevent cholera. And if you had something less than that, you could still have a claim for a mention. I mean, the mention that was endowed with the interests of the Briand Trust. So, I mean, you got money and you got uh, the credit of the Academy of Sciences, nonetheless. And, of course, for Ferran, I mean, this seemed ideal. And in that very summer of 1885, in the midst of the controversy, he made a first submission to the uh, Academy, sending all the stuff he, had, he was compiling. He failed, tried again the following year, failed again, and he just gave up. Although the, the Academy of Science awarded him a sort of retrospective brilliant in 1907 as a sort of lifetime award, I mean, for his career. <laughs> That's really, I didn't know the Academy did these things, but they did. Uh, but still, the award was entirely agnostic about the vaccine. I mean, they, I mean, they, they granted him merit, but they didn't settle the question of whether the vaccine worked or, or not. And for Ferran's supporters, for the Ferranistas, this was a complete disaster. Uh, this was a complete disaster because they thought that Ferran deserved more. I mean, Ferran, for the Ferranistas, if he hadn't, he hadn't won the brand because the academy was clearly chauvinist. I mean, they were friends. And you know how friends are seen in Spain. I mean, they had invited us, now we send them a vaccine, of course, they are not going to, to like it. Technically, the argument was, had he been French with exactly the same data, I mean, he would have got a mention of the brand. But since he, since he was an independent scholar, working from a backwater country without scientific tradition, we cannot, uh, I mean, we cannot award him that. That's what the Ferranistas thought the Academy had done. And this popular view that you could find in the press made it into the early histories of the controversy. Pulido, a disciple of Ferran, wrote a first history of Ferran's achievements in which, I mean, he licensed this interpretation. And then it evolved into a more sophisticated account in terms of scientific nationalism that you could still see in, in the works of Lopez Piñero or Bornside, both in Spanish and in English. And unluckily for us, so we found this view as well in <laughs> Reviewers V report. You know, there's always a mythical Reviewer V. I mean, our Reviewer V for this paper said, but look, I, you're, getting all, you're getting it all wrong about this Privreant because you're saying that it was a, a scientific prize that should recognize scientific merit. It was not. It was a tool of the French scientific diplomacy. The prize was awarded depending on the interests of the French uh, administration uh, every year. And you know, there is now a big fad among historians of science about scientific diplomacy. It's uh, the new lingo, I mean, that's you know, I mean, contemporary and ancient. Apparently, it's at the end of the 19th century when the 
scientific policies start taking on uh, an international role and the Pribrian would have been an early illustration of this. So Review B recommended our paper to be rejected because he thought that uh, the Ferranistas were actually right, that the whole thing was about nationalistic pride, chauvinism and the like. So what could we do? So Clara and I uh, decided that we'd go to the Academy of Science and see what the archive was. I mean, so, so what, what, what was in the archives about the Pribriand? And then we double-checked with other archives in Germany and, and Spain. And I mean, to cut the story short, because if I were a real historian of science, then I would start going into the details and bore you to no end. I'm not going to do that, because I'm Spanish. And I know that if we have a seminar at 3 on a Friday, <laughs> Afternoon, you shouldn't do that. You should do something like you should summarize, it, which is what I do in my next slide. So, just let's focus on one review of Ferran's submission. So, Ferran has submitted his dossier with the results of his vaccination campaign in Valencia, and this dossier was assigned to a French pathologist, a professor at Sorbonne, a former colleague, Leon Goslan, who, I mean, tried his best to decode what was in that dossier because he found the dossier messy. That's what he recorded on the, on the deliberations. Messy, why? Well, because it was full of contradictory and incomplete documents. For a start, there was no clear vaccination protocol. I mean, Ferran had been vaccinated in like 20 to 30 towns, and in each town, he tried different doses. He tried different things. Then, he wasn't submitting uh, the whole record of his campaign. He was only covering five of the 13 weeks in which he had been vaccinating, and he was just submitting data for seven towns instead of the 20 or 30 in which he had worked. And moreover, he wasn't providing a statistical analysis. He was just um, he, he was just submitting the raw data, uh, letting the academy make up their mind on to what that meant. Now, just to give you a visual flavor of what would that was like. So what Ferran was submitting is what you can see on the right hand side, which is a regist registrar's note. So the Le Notaire, the, the registrar, I mean, in its town, I mean, prepared a sort of formal document saying Ferran has been here for some weeks and he has vaccinated these people and there have been so many deaths. The population of this town is this. So on the basis of these notes, Goselan, in the document that you see on the left hand side, uh, was trying to calculate, I mean, what was the proportion of deaths between the inoculated and the uninoculated people, assuming that if there was a significant difference between these, but there was no statistical significant, significance yet to be measured, that if there was a, a striking difference between these two proportions, the vaccine uh, should be doing something. And what we can see here is that Goslan actually bothered to do so. I mean, he, he just started counting deaths and counting vaccines and doing these proportions and he found that there was no clear sign for the efficacy of the vaccine. Now, what we conclude here, Clara and I, against the Ferranistas is that the quality of the submitted data didn't allow the Academy to award the Briand to, um, to Ferran. But the rejoinder of the Ferranistas, it's wonderful, this comes of the Ferranistas, is that, no, 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 I mean, you're getting this wrong because there was a double standard. If with this same set of data, Ferran had been friends, I mean, he would have got the award. I mean, because these people didn't care about the quality of the data. They cared about their interests. And what they were doing here is protecting Pasteur. I mean, they couldn't uh, allow as Spaniards to become the, this co the pioneer in cholera vaccination when surely, I mean, somebody from Pasteur's lab is about to get the same result. So that is the differentistas view of this world. Now, that's a legitimate concern. I mean, of course, I mean, French scholars are known for their national pride, <laughs> to put it mildly. And uh, I mean, how could we adjudicate this controversy? Well, I mean, since I'm an empiricist about counterfactuals, because this is a counterfactual, had he, we thought we could try a sort of controlled comparison. I mean, let's see if in the brand, uh, if in the brand record, is there somebody from outside France who, got some, who was similar enough to Ferran and got the award. And much uh, to our surprise, we found 
Philip Hauser. Philip Hauser was a Spanish physician working on cholera who got a mention in this award uh, a couple of years after Ferran tried. Uh, so, I mean, this was evidence in our, in our view that the academy was sort of capable of recognizing some scientific merits to foreigners. Now, you might say, Philip Hauser, that, sounds very, that doesn't sound very Spaniard to me. Well, I grant you that. I mean, he was born in Austria, he had worked in Paris and then in Morocco, but settled down in Seville, and in Seville, uh, after 10 years, he got the Spanish nationality. So he was submitting uh, his stuff to the ground as a Spaniard. Now, intellectually speaking, he couldn't be more different than Ferrand. For a start, his understanding of cholera was totally opposite. He was a disadvantaged Pettenkoffer, a uh, German uh, physician who thought that cholera uh, propagated depending on the quality of the soil. I mean, the soil and the hygiene of the places were the key factor in cholera expansion. And as a disciple of Pettenkoffer, uh, Hauser, I mean, thought that he could prove this with the Spanish cholera outbreak of 1885. And he, since he was a very good networker, he mobilized uh, all his friends and colleagues in the Spanish administration and gathered data about cholera propagation from 800 towns. And these 800 towns, I mean, were uh, added up into three volumes in which he published the raw data, the tabulated data, plus a series of maps showing how cholera advanced one way or another, coming quickly or slowly, or slowly, depending on the quality of the soil. Now, for this, in 1888, he got a mention of the Ferrand, but the Academy, again, was agnostic about his theoretical outlook. I mean, they didn't want to take sides with uh, Petenkoffe. What they thought was that the quality of the data was fantastic, <coughs> and that the quality of the data was a merit enough to award him a uh, mention of the brand. Still, I mean, the official record in Spain today for this epidemic is um, Hauser's compilation. So I mean, it, has, it has stood the test of time. So, what do we conclude here? Why did Hauser succeed where Ferran uh, had failed? And I see that there is a typo in the, on the slide. Well, Reviewer B, of course, had a, a, an, an answer to this question. I mean, his answer was that uh, he was not truly a Spaniard. I mean, he was uh, a cosmopolitan person, well-connected in Paris, and protected by the Rothschilds, I mean, the, the Jewish bankers, and he, he himself was a Jew. So it is these, it, 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 uh, it's, it's these internal connections that explain his success. And here is where we get to the philosophy, uh, because the point is, for us, okay, how far can you multiply your hypothesis about uh, the biases that explain the behavior of people without making this concept of bias empty? And can you postulate external factors for everything we find in the record? Uh, the alternative interpretation that we put forward in the paper is that Hauser understood much better than Ferran, I mean, how to overcome biases. And for this, we draw on some previous work on mine on the role biases play in scientific experiments. Because scientific experiments are, create a sort of adversarial situation. An adversarial situation means that you're an experimenter, you have to persuade an audience, other scientists or lay people. But you cannot presuppose that your audience has the same priors that you do. They might have different theoretical preconceptions, they might have different personal interests or financial interests or institutional interests. And yet, your experiment should persuade these people in a way that overcomes all these biases and make them agree with you. That's the value of an experiment. Now, how can you design an experiment, how can you design an evidence-gathering process in a way that overcomes these biases. Well, you anticipate the objection and you organize your data collection process in a way that will answer those future objections. So if you think they are going to accuse you of uh, tampering with your patients, 
uh, selecting patients in a self-serving manner, randomize them. I mean, do not do the allocation yourself. I mean, use randomization. If you think that the expectations of the participants are going to bias this process, blind them. Why? Because if you do it, if you do this, I mean, you are fending off a potential objection and you are increasing the probability of persuading an audience that would otherwise object. Well, you're tampering with your data, you're tampering with the expectations of your patients, but if you could control for those, I mean, you would see that your results disappear. So the general outlook that I have been presenting in my work is uh, scientific experiments are situations in which you need to persuade people who don't agree with you in principle and who will object to, to you in very personal terms. You've done things wrong. You are being carried away by your biases. The answer to these objections, to make your uh, experiment persuasive, should be based on the, uh, I mean, on the anticipation of those uh, challenges and in a design of the data gathering process that anticipates and fends off those challenges. Now, Ferran was clearly doing that. I mean, Ferran was submitting data that were clearly self-serving. I mean, he was clearly sending the data that he thought could prove his hypothesis, but not the full record of his hypothesis, of his data. He was just sending them uh, the material, uh, the document, documented the success of the experience in those places where it had apparently prevented deaths. But he said nothing about uh, everything else he had done. Which is a bit the same strategy that we see today uh, in pharmaceutical companies. I mean, not disclosing the trials in full, but just releasing the subgroup analysis that somehow gives signs of efficacy of what they do. And the remedy uh, against this bias, the way to make your um, data persuasive, is to release them in full. I mean, disclose all the data you have and let people make up their minds for themselves, which is exactly what Hauser did. I mean, Hauser's main epistemic merit was the completeness. And he was, I mean, he had amassed um, I mean, I mean, an enormous uh, amount of data and he was releasing those data in full, organized in a way with uh, the, the data presentation formats, the maps, the tabulation, organized in a way that allowed people to see for themselves whether uh, his hypotheses were good or not. Interestingly, Hauser didn't persuade the audience about the virtues of Pet and Koffer, but they didn't contest his uh, uh, data either. I mean, he said, your data are good, it's just that they are not persuasive enough. Now, so in this regard, I mean, there would be I mean, there would have been a good reason for the Academy not to give Ferran the award, just because the quality of his data was significantly inferior than the quality of um, Hauser's data. And this is a sign of an emerging culture of uh, evidence in the medical sciences by the end of the 19th century, a culture that has been documented by other historians as well. I mean, Ted Porter, in his recent book on uh, the madhouses, I mean, he, it was about, I mean, how medical records, I mean, were formatted and used to, to prove points about the uh, heredity of certain uh, psychiatric conditions, uh, and so on and so forth. So what we see is that by the end of the 19th century, there is an emerging new culture of proof in medicine in which the quality of the data made your hypothesis more or less credible. And that's something that, uh, that our story illustrates. So it's quite a different story than uh, chauvinism versus French versus Spanish chauvinism. It's a story uh, of I know, science in progress, uh, very conservative, very old fashioned. But still, I mean, the Ferranistas might have one final objection that again, I mean, resonates with, with our recent experience of the pandemic. That was a medical emergency, not a scientific experiment. I mean, Ferran's goal was to save people's lives not to prove his point. So he was vaccinating as best as he could, he was trying to get the data he, that, he, that, that he could gather, but the primary purpose of his vaccination campaign was not scientific, was medical, was humanitarian. So in a medical emergency, those, that, those are the data, that's the evidence that we have to deal with. And it would be unfair to Ferran 
to have demand, I mean, to demand more. I mean, Hauser was working from the comfort of his cabinet, Ferran was in the field, I mean, getting his hands dirty, vaccinating people himself. Okay, point taken, and I agree that uh, in an emergency, uh, the quality of scientific data diminish. And that's something that we all witnessed during the pandemic. But the conclusion I think we should draw from this is that those data are never going to be persuasive. I mean, it might license a uh, political decision like, okay, it's better to vaccinate than not to, but they are not going to unanimously persuade the scientific community. I mean, they are not going to sell down the controversy, which is precisely what we found during all that first stage of the pandemic in which we were discussing hydroxychloroquine, as Juliet followed closely and denounced. I mean, we were doing all sorts of strange things. Uh, in scientific terms that were uh, justified in terms of humanitarian concerns. I mean, I leave to the bioethicist to decide whether this was good or bad, and Juliet, of course, thought it was bad. Uh, but from a purely epistemic point of view, the point is that those data are never going to be persuasive if we found ourselves in an adversarial situation in which not everybody I mean, has the same priors about what we are doing. Okay, what is the what follows from that? Well, it follows from that that uh, we need to be agnostic about the historical processes that are taking place there. So, if we cannot conclude, uh, if we don't have an agreement on what the standard for evidence is, we cannot start talking fully about biases. Because in science, in science, biases are deviations from a norm. Only when we have a norm about how to do things well, we can uh, speak of a bias as a deviation from that. We can only speak about nationalism as a deviation, uh, so as a deviation from an epistemic standard. When we have an epistemic standard about when to adjudicate uh, scientific prices. So, if we use Hauser as evidence about, I mean, as a benchmark about how to do things right we might conclude that the Academy was justified in giving him the award and not to Ferran. Because even if, I mean, these French academics were very biased themselves, at least they showed they could behave occasionally, I mean, in a correct manner. I mean, giving uh, awards to people who deserve them and denying them to others. The alternative, I mean, like doing history without this, with history of science without this evidential benchmark is to use bias as a grand narrative. Biases as explanatory devices that can uh, account for any phenomenon you observe, which is our controversy with the UV. I mean, we kept uh, sending responses, and UV came up with explanations in terms of no, it's all nationalism. It's sold chauvinism. It's sold the academy. But that's entirely legitimate. We saw it during COVID. I mean, COVID is capitalism. COVID is pharmaceutical uh, hidden uh, calculation. But in the end, I mean, those one narratives, I mean, do not help us to achieve any consensus, do not, el do not elucidate, um, I mean, the practical situations we have to deal with. Uh, and that was basically what I wanted to tell you today, if I am correct, in about 30 minutes, sharp. And with this, we can close, because it's Friday afternoon. Thanks, you can upload now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think that, that's someone Yeah, there's one person online. Uh, Hello. <laughs> Et, et pour les colloques, si vous voulez, on peut le faire en français. Oui, c'est si, 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 si. euh, bah, Non, en espagnol, oui, le, lui, il le fait en espagnol. Non, mais... 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 Non, I mean, so, so we'll English for, okay, do it however you want and we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out. I mean, if you do want to do it in French, it's fine. I will tra no, do it in French and I will translate it into English in my answer. So, oh. okay.
Du coup, j'ai vu plusieurs questions. Une qui est purement de la curiosité et deux qui sont plus substantielles. Euh, purement par curiosité, qui est-ce qui a gagné au final le prix Brion Personne n'a eu. Nobody won the prix Brion in full in okay. the end. Not even the French. Not even the French. Okay. okay. It was embarrassing actually. Et ça, c'est la seconde question. Et, um, so, I see that, politically speaking, there are a lot of issues. No, but yeah. I was wondering how. Ah, c'est grand français. Je me demandais à quel point, parce que la conférence en anglais, c'est vrai. Je me demandais à quel point les standards locaux de présentation de la recherche, en dehors des questions politiques et autres, jouaient dans cette histoire. C'est-à-dire que j'imagine que la manière de présenter des données, de présenter des, des interprétations de ces données, de ces données en, en France, en Allemagne, en Espagne, diffère euh, à cette époque-là, sûrement. Il n'y a pas de standard universel, j'imagine. À quel point est-ce que ça, ça joue en dehors des questions purement nationalistes ou de politique interne Non, c'est la question qui est la pour ces historiques d'analyse. La question que je répète pour les audiences est à quel point il y a eu un standard standard et un standard shared standard sur comment les données médicales doivent être présentées. Et la réponse était qu'il n'y a pas. Donc, dans les années 19e, je veux dire, there is an emerging culture of medical records. So basically, France and in particular Parisian hospitals began, began to standardize, I mean, the collection of data for each patient and archiving those data as a future source of evidence. But this was a very local process that wasn't replicated elsewhere. I mean, we saw other signs of it in the UK uh, about the same period, but by the end of the 19th century, we still don't have among physicians like a shared standard of how uh, data should be formatted and delivered. Still, uh, those who were shared in the sense that, I mean, that was agreed by the whole community and implemented in a uniform manner, I mean, across Europe. Still, the cognoscenti, I mean, those who were uh, following up the research closely, I mean, we're aware that uh, if you wanted to show that you had a treatment that worked, I mean, whatever the treatment, you, it should make a difference in between the death, death ratios. We still didn't have medical statistics uh, as we did uh, the medical statistics that we had 30 years later uh, when Fisher started tinkering with his clinical trials. I mean, Pearson had only begun to... I'm, I'm saying all this for Charles, in case it's who is. <laughs> so, so Charles would know all these people. So, uh, so Pearson, I mean, who was started, who ha, who had started to try his hand at uh, medical data. But among physicians, I mean, there was still no shared criterion of data interpretation. But we observe here, observe here how there, was, there is an international standard emerging about that data presentation. Because you needed to report your data in a way that allowed people to calculate the, these death proportions. And everybody in the, in the field did this uh, one in another way. And what we see is that uh, the academy was trying, I mean, was favoring the data presentation that allowed them to do their work better, to do this particular kind of work better. So it's a, um, I know, um, it's a birth moment uh, for this story. And I presume that uh, there's a lot of work to do here in the history of statistics, but since we only started to care about data recently, uh, some, it'll take a, still some time to see how it all evolved. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> and we might have a, we, we, we might have a drink later. Sure, I mean, just sure. To, I mean, just <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I really like it. I really like because I I I saw this as a goal for empiricism in historical research, and a goal for historians not to take for granted historical. Um, that, that's, category, that's what it is. Um, the, the the category of, of standards. First of all, in the category of nationalism, because you show very clearly that it was the Ferranistas who are the, the, the historians of science of the late 90s, they just repeated what the Ferranistas were saying, yeah. which was saying, accusing the French of nationalists to defend their, their scientists. So I think that that's really nice. Um, and and uh, what else I wanted to say? 
um, yes, and that, that sort of putting nationalism or, or the notion of bias as an explanatory tool, but without showing exactly how those things are connected, um, it's like putting the cart before the horse. It, 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 it's not showing much. So I, I, I really empathize with that because I, that's something I always struggle with, uh, really showing how things are actually political, how things are actually ideological. Um, but uh, there's something that um, sort of the historian in me was 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 <laughs> the, the, finally, the, finally. <laughs> was, was um, doubting is that perhaps this is not just a, a story of because this you could be it, it seemed at the point that you were uh, putting the history as is this an internalistic history of science or is this an externalistic history of science? Should we study it uh, from from the, the internal mechanisms of what comes as, as um, scientific evidence, or should we use uh, external um, explanations? And but maybe, um, and that's what I try always to do, is to put those things together. Because at some point you, you show that uh, the reason why Hauser, the, the, yeah. the Austrian, um, the Spanish Austrian um, scientist, that he, um, how do you, he, he understood better. What, how to overcome his audience nationalistic bias. So I feel like that's precisely where um, Ferran failed, um, is that he, that he didn't know how to construct his data as his audience wanted to, to see it. And I feel like that, that, that understanding, uh, that, that understanding this, um, and not actually being connected to, to Paris and that those people are the people going to go and say, hey, uh, give him the, the prix de Brown. Uh, but that his understanding, because he spent time with the, the French people, is, oh, uh, that's exactly what they need, that's how I'm going to present it. And so I feel like that's the, exactly the place where, yeah, where the, the internal story meets the external story. Exactly. And that, that it feels like, um, I don't know if, if you agree, but that this is a sort of, that this culture of evidence, how it was constructed precisely at that point, it is nationalistic. So it's not like nationalism doesn't play a role in the story, but it plays a role in, in, in the making of data uh, or the making of, of uh, practices. Um, so I, I don't know if you, if you would agree. I don't know. I, I know it's lovely because this allows me to, this allows me to, to present my own so worldview developed over the last 25 years after my arrival in Lova, in Luananev. So I spent these three months here, and after that, I mean, the, the shadow of Cardinal Mercier uh, followed me and illuminated me. No, but the, 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 here's why, no, but see, honestly, honestly speaking, so I grew up in a world in which still, I mean, the reference point in the philosophy of science was, okay, when science is done right, I mean, everything else is excluded, biases, mysteries, uh, human. I remember that when I arrived in London for my dissertation, and I asked, I mean, I met John Worrell, and I said, well, John, my project is to um, see, I mean, how impartiality is achieved in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I mean, in what sense we can tell that, uh, and we, we can claim that uh, a trial is impartial. And he went, well, we should assume scientists are impartial, he went, otherwise we are all screwed. And I thought, fuck, that's literally the old view. <laughs> but, I mean, historians and sociologists of science after Kuhn, I mean, had been showing quite extensively that the world of science is quite impure and that what you see is a world of biases at work and interests in conflict. And, I mean, it's only the philosopher that eventually uh, pretends to see something different there. But the reality of life is uh, the conflict of worldviews and bias. So my thought was, I mean, following the inspiration of some friends and colleagues was, well look, but isn't there a way in which even if the world is impure and we are all uh, self-serving and biased, isn't there a way to control for those biases and to reach some common ground? Because, I mean, a different way of reading the history of science is, well, I mean, if we all were, if we were all seeking our own interests ruthlessly, we would never agree. And the history of science is the history of agreements. Because if I am conducting an experiment and nobody's going to agree with me because they would make them wrong, that would make experiment would make them wrong and would make me right, well, there would be no winner. And the, the, the beauty of science is that there are winners. I mean, the, the, 
that there are no prices, that, 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 that there is somebody who persuade, persuades everybody else. So, the thing is, when scientists agree, I mean, are these agreements like a mafia agreement? Like, oh, let's all pretend that this works even if we don't, and we know it doesn't. I mean, that, there was no mutiny in Rostov yesterday. It was all under control. I mean, is this this sort of agreement in which we pretend that things are as we wish they are, rather than as they actually happen? Or rather, do we try to sort of reach an agreement based on uh, some agreed requirements? Okay, you and I disagree. And one of us is going to win and the other to lose in this experiment. I mean, it might me make me a winner and you a loser. You will uh, lose the reputation and the money that I, get from, that I will get from this treatment. So how could we design the test in a way that you will accept the defeat that I win and the opposite? And that's where epistemic standards play a role to make us agree. That's how we achieve impartiality. Okay. We are going to make the experiment in a way that both parts consider us correct. And it's like a lottery. Whoever wins uh, gets it and everybody else accepts the misery of losing. That's what, I mean, that's my philosophy here. So you, you, you point it right, I mean, there are two ways. So what Hauser did was to play by rules that he thought uh, would make people accept his Petenkofferian views. And you might say, but he knew these, these rules because he was an insider and he was cosmopolitan and he knew how to play this game, mm. whereas Ferran didn't. Uh, that's probably right. I mean, that's how we all uh, get to know things, I mean, through personal connections, I mean, following our interests. But then, then the, the key point is that once these rules are in place, uh, they are the same for everybody. But at the time, it was not; they were not in place yet. That, that they were, they were still being constructed. That's what I call the constitutional moment of uh, these data events. Constitutional, in the sense that when we draft a constitution, uh, we need to agree on rules uh, without any binding agreements. And just so, how do we negotiate constitutions? So, go ahead. But so, so then, it, I, I, would you say that nationalism does play an explanatory? In in your history or not at all? I think that there was lots of nationalism at play in the academy. I think that everybody was um, biased by uh, their national prejudices, but there were things, I mean, there were epistemic devices in place to control for those biases. I mean, when you go to the archive, what you see is that poor Goslan, I mean, knew he had to deliver a report based on death proportions. And this was all secret. I mean, nobody was going to check these calculations. I mean, he could have come up and said, I mean, this Ferran, I mean, he's a fucking loser. I mean, just ignore him. But no, I mean, he redid all the, cal I mean, he re went through the statistics, uh, tabulated them, I mean, did the calculations, and said, well, it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, he knew that in order to persuade everybody else, this was the way to go. He could have spared himself this if it was all based on chauvinism, but he took the bother. And that's, that's the interesting thing. Ferran himself, I mean, presented tabulated data much later. I mean, it's open to discussion whether, had he waited a little bit, I mean, had he waited a couple of years uh, and delivered things in a more structured way, I mean, he might have got the, he might have got the Ferran, but he chose to arrive first. He went for priority. Lost. So that's the thing. I, I, I think that uh, nationalism plays a huge role, but there are devices that somehow constrain mm -hmm. your nationalism, and these devices are what explain the scientific consensus they reach. Okay. So I'm interested in this next question. Uh, question is going, to, I think, to ask also one of the person in the chat as well. Okay. Um, so basically you make a comparison uh, between Ferran and Hauser, but I guess you, you didn't get to give us a lot of details, but basically I'm... I'm the, these are in the paper. I mean, the paper yeah. is forthcoming and so I'm if finally we defeated the URB. I don't have the details, so I'm going to ask. Basically, with 
what you gave us. I, I feel like there are so many gaps and things that are missing from your argument. Uh, I mean, so for instance, uh, was the reviewer the same? Was it different? Because we all know that sometimes we were to submit and we have like, different reviews. Like you got a fair mistake reviewer, so could have happened. Uh, but also I'm thinking, I think you probably need more than just one comparison mm -hmm. to make the argument. I feel like because uh, you need to see what are the overall yeah, yeah, layouts yeah. of the whole, I don't know, maybe five, ten years of the team uh, to make any kind of generalization. Generalization, I mean, I don't feel like comparing to, because it's very similar, it's both cholera, uh, Spanish, and a few years after Ferran's submission, so it could be that one bias is that he was just better than Ferran, and that's why he got the prize. So it could also be this, like, and you also have other gaps, which is maybe they have person, uh, the guy had the house had personal connection, like the blues would be so hard to get, or maybe Ferran had enemies. Like we all know that this kind of stuff could influence a uh, key at the academy. Like you know, maybe you will have to get le personal letters, or I don't know, maybe it's not even possible. So you have many explanations that could. Uh, could be like, alternative, yeah, and alternative accounts of exactly the same record. No, you're absolutely right. Um, and no, no, that's uh, so. Here, there is this tension between how historians like history to be written mm -hmm. and how an empiricist uh, would do this. Because I mean, historians want all the details of the case. I mean, historians do not like. I mean, the. The, do not like generalizations except if they are built on a case-by-case -case basis. And each case should be incredibly detailed. So... Uh, I, can, I can make my question clear. No, no, no. no. Like you, you mentioned that there is a standard to make the evidence, to present the evidence in a certain way. But to make that claim, you have to... You, you know, you, you, no, I was, got, I was getting there. No, but I was getting there and you were absolutely right. So I was gonna explain. I mean, how I got oh. to to that point. So basically, it is that I mean, what do you? I mean, to un, I mean, to answer your objection, what we would have had to do is to go through the entire record of the academy and see for each brand that was awarded, why it was awarded, how were the data presented, and for each failure, I mean, see what the quality was, and I mean, on the basis of all these data, I mean present a paper on how, what was the emerging standard of the academy uh, during the end of the 19th century. And this would uh, ground properly my claim. And this is absolutely correct. <laughs> and this is how it should be done. Okay. What, I mean, why didn't we do it? Well, basically, and this is what I was starting to explain, because uh, historians do not like this empiricist approach. I mean, they want, I mean, for them, uh, and this is to me a perfect, perfectly legitimate concern, for them, I mean, every case should be studied on its own merit, and we should uh, understand the circumstances of each candidate and how it was awarded. So it's not just a matter of checking the record and see what was in the record, but rather who's the candidate, who's assessing it, who's the jury, I mean, how are they working? So. Since this was a thesis in the history of science, we thought, I mean, let's first start uh, with Ferran. And Hauser came only as a, uh, as a secondary project once we realized uh, that uh, the claim that most historians were making was, well, this is, this is just a conspiracy against Spaniards. Mm -hmm. So this is the general claim. We give a counterexample. Now, because this guy is Spaniard and actually presenting data differently, he got the award. That's more or less, and if you say that something more is at work, let, that, let show us where, because we went through archives in Germany, Sp France, and Spain, and we couldn't find a trace. I mean, we didn't find a smoking gun. I mean, it was all a controversy about. So that's the limited claim that you find in the paper. But like I said at the beginning, it's Friday. It's the end of June. <laughs> I mean, I needed to I needed to spice this up. So I thought 
I mean, I'm going to make something sexier, which is to say, well, look, there's an emerging data culture at the Academy of Science in which you could see, I mean, how uh, this guy, Ferran, I mean, was failing to persuade people, whereas uh, Hauser was succeeding. And the evidence that we have for this is completely limited. Okay. We are presenting this as a hypothesis that uh, might hold or not. I mean, uh, the, the reason I'm asking this is because, well, I'm not in the history of medicine in France at the time, and even later, like a hundred years later, uh, no, maybe not a hundred, but a lot of, like much later on, and the standards are not that high. No, 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 no. So I'm very surprised that the standards were so high for the pre period. That's but my, I'm just surprised, and I think. I would be very much interested to, to, to know whether it was... But the, the, that is the, the elite nature of the academy. So basically, uh, this is what I was as, uh, answering to Kevin before that, I mean... But also the type of data, because so those are Korea vaccine and they have a lot of vaccination data. But because this is France and the hero was Pasteur, but also Claude Bernard, I mean, statistic and all, it was not... Yeah, they, 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 they didn't like it. They would want. It would be more like mechanis mechanistic mm -hmm. data, yeah. animal studies. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, that, that so is. So, but what you're mm -hmm. saying is absolutely correct. I mean, uh, there are a number of historians that have shown to what extent there was an allergy to data in the French uh, system um, at, by the mid 19th century. So it is sort of surprising that uh, these people started appreciating it. Uh, but it's not implausible because, I mean, the, what we know about the controversies of the 50s was vanishing already by the... I mean, at the same time that this was happening, there was this other emerging culture of medical records. So there were the popes and mandarins saying uh, statistics deprives us of clinical judgment, mm -hmm. but at the same time there were other physicians who were collecting records because we thought, they thought, oh well, I mean this might do something. So there was this tension. At the same time, uh, there was an international pressure for tabulation. I mean, the people are, that's a separate paper for the, for which I can show the evidence. I mean, there was an emerging awareness that if you want your data to be persuasive, you should tabulate them. I mean, organize these in a manner that allows people to make up their minds. There is the CRC project by Lucas Engelman now in Edinburgh, in which they are trying to make exactly this point. I mean, this emerging culture of tabulation played a cognitive role in making people agree. In the Academy of Science, by the end of the 19th century, was a super elite situation in which you had people who were just on top of their world. I mean, they knew what was happening? What was happening in many different countries? They were an international hub, so they were aware of. I mean, the allergy to statistical calculations, uh, the necessity to present records in a way that is readable for everybody, and that people in um, other empires, other colonial empires like the British Empire or the Russian Empire. I mean, they were tabulating as a way to communicate the discoveries. So. All these things coalesce, might coalesce into a, a single narrative, but you're absolutely right. I don't have the full evidence for this. It's just a hint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I thought it's more entertaining. What can I do? <laughs> <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just didn't want to bore you to death. <laughs> there is one. Yeah. Do you want to ask it? Sure. Uh, really? Yeah. Um, so you said that the Germans were not the person here saying, "I am wondering why there is only one review for Ferran submission." that the rejection is based on the expert judgment of one person. Does this impact the interpretation in terms of bias? The collective bias of a committee would not be the same of the personal bias of one individual. That's a very, very good point, actually. Uh, and this, I mean, that, but that's about the, re the review culture. And that's a, a separate problem in itself. So no, thanks so much for this, because it, I mean, it came to my mind uh, at some point, and then I, I forgot about this thing, because the standard practice that we, I mean, we went to the archive and we saw all the submissions and we tried to document who was doing what. So the standard practice for doing the award, for awarding the brand was 
that each sub submission was given to a reviewer who should pre present a report and then the committee uh, decided in full on the basis of that report. So the expectation was that uh, the committee should override uh, the personal biases of one of the individuals. And this is what I was sort of answering to Max before. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the reason why Goslan was so obsessed with the calculation was that he, because he needed to persuade the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, but it remains to be seen to what extent this committee was uh, a serious scientific body with serious disagreement among the members, or rather a sort of mafia-style uh, committee in which they all, I mean, get on with the decisions on the basis of uh, mutual favors and interests. The evidence that we have gathered, and this came from reviewer B as well, uh, I said, well, look, I mean, who's doing this? Uh, who are the members of this committee? And interestingly, it's difficult to find, I mean, there's only, there's a limit to what we can know about the views of these people, because some of them are known, others are already unknown, and there are no sources for them. So we can only reason by proxy as to what they might have thought and how they might have thought it. So in the paper, we make a footnote on this and say, well, look, the committee was diverse enough to justify the decision. Uh, but of course, again, the evidence is inconclusive because we, I mean, some evidence about these people are, is completely lost. So uh, the historian should make up their mind to study. Do I fill this gap or do I remain agnostic? But thanks for this. Ooh, that's question. <laughs> Kevin. So, uh, I have more questions, it's quite relevant to today's scientific communication. What your history is showing uh, quite clearly is that despite the loss of the communication, scientific communication for Ferrans, you want the public communication, right? Because there are uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, is it uh, the standard for public communications are different from the standard for the scientific communication? And in today's fight for climate change or even for COVID, we saw that some people want a big communication, but they've lost the situation and they reverse. So how different is it? And does, can you, can you, yeah, uh, I, 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 you I, articulate I, both so that you can both, I, mean both at the same time? I can elaborate on this. You know, that's, uh, I mean, this was the conversation that we were having in a way with Juliet over lunch uh, about the different problem, which is, so Goslan, the reviewer, was complaining that Ferran was releasing data to the press uh, that wasn't being included in the dossier. So uh, Goslan assumed a sort of hierarchy in which if you wanted to be a serious scientist, you should first submit your data to the specialized scientific community and then release it. Whereas Ferran, who was vaccinating uh, in a as an outcast, I mean, without any official support, I mean, preparing the vaccines on his own, he needed to win the Spanish public opinion, because otherwise he would be stopped. So he had to choose between persuading first the academy or persuading first the Spanish audience. And he went for the audience for moral reasons. He said, well, look, my primary duty as a physician is to care. So, but the thing is that uh, the academy saw this differently saying, well, look, I mean, uh, you might pretend to care, uh, but what was the name of the hydroxy... Raoul, Didier, Didier Raoul. So, I mean, you might pretend that you want to be curing people, but how do we know that you're really intentional? How do we know you're not um, uh, seeking fame of recognition? And Raoul's question was, well, look, how can you question my uh, intentions? I mean, it's clear that I'm doing this for the... And then, in time, we found out what Raoul was actually doing, and Juliet saw very clearly uh, right at the beginning. That's the thing. I mean, in a medical emergency, I mean, you should not trust by default people who uh, claim they can save you and tried to persuade uh, the public before persuading the experts. I mean, the, but that is a general problem in the history of science. It's only that uh, in medicine it has more traumatic consequences, but Stephen Jay Gould, I mean, who was a complete dissenter in the history of paleontology, how did he uh, make his course progress? I mean, writing wonderful popular books, 
that gave a vision of the field that was irresistible but didn't overlap with the consensus among experts. So gradually what we have seen over the last hundred years is that uh, in order to make science progress, more and more scientists are invoking the public to, um, I mean, to support the cause. And they might have good intentions, but in the end, uh, they create an awful mess. As the, I mean, you, you start skipping the protocols. Um, but the concern is that for scientific, so to establish scientific uh, results, you need a lot of time, right? So you need time for seeing to settle and for communication to be established. But you, times of emergency, do you have the time to do that? Well, the thing is that you you have you need the money mostly because for run was self-funded. So he said, "Well, I need the money. How do I get the money? How do I get the the funders to to support me?" Well, I mean, I'm gonna they're gonna find me the newspapers because the scientists are skeptical, reluctant, and so uh, yeah, that is our world. And, and the interesting thing is that so for me, the, the funny the funny thing is that as you can imagine. Uh, by the end of the 19th century in Spain, the press uh, and our pol the political system was quite rudimentary. I mean, so there were very few readers, uh, and, and, and the politics was, um, I mean, there was an alternation rule between conservatives and liberals, so the elections were uh, fraudulent. I mean, so we're not talking about the same regime that we observed today, but still the debates are strikingly similar. And, and the solutions, <laughs> just, uh, so uh, I don't know what to make of these, but... Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, two questions, one uh, just curiosity, uh, and the other one more like historiography. Uh, the curiosity is that, um, did he know um, uh, Ramon y Cajal? Did they collaborate in any way? Because I know that Cajal was involved in, in Valencia with the color vaccine. Oh, you, you, know, you know a lot then. Yeah, true, true, true. So I, I, and also he, he had this, this debate with Golgi, right, which also played and was explained and still explained in very nationalistic terms, like Spain, Italy, who's the best. Um, so I, I don't know if, if there's a connection there, personal connection, or at the level of, of country, rivalry. Ka Cajal was at first four and then became skeptic. If I remember the story correctly, because this is something that Clara did, and I think that Cajal was put off by the excessive exposure to mm. the to the press. I mean, he was uh, he was more the long runner. I mean, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. But that that was the the, um, the, the fun question. The other one is um, so I still haven't wrapped my head around this, but I also struggle with this issue of the archive never being complete and uh, always missing the smoking gun and uh, uh, what this has led me has been to go from one archive to the other obsessively thinking that I'm going to find it thinking I found it and then realizing no I actually haven't found it and then sort of accumulate documents until you drown in documents <laughs> um, and so you say that because we don't have the empirical evidence of the documents of how some of the decisions might have been due to nationalism um, that we should remain agnostic but my my question is that if we, we we accept that the archives are imperfect always should is is, is saying uh, we should remain agnostic not simply following um, what the archives already are biased because bias of, 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 of uh, committees and, and so on, I guess I'm also looking at committees, are very partial of how what the discussion was really about. Um, so, so there's already a, a process of making the archive which incorporates all the biases, nationalism, sexism, you name it, into it. It filters out what should be included and what should be excluded. Um, for the, uh, including possible deniability to, to appear more scientific, what, what have you. So m my struggle was is how do I engage with this with this missing because I feel like um, we cannot remain agnostic. Uh, That's my problem. That, that we we just we just 
have to engage with that bias of the archive itself. Um, and so I'm, I'm just not sure whether agnosticism is, is possible. Well, it all depends on whether you want to be an empiricist or not about these things, because um, here's the thing. I mean, when I was in, very, in, when I was in Luan uh 25 years ago, I discovered that there was a, a, a conference in the history of economics, at the beginning which I was then engaged, uh, and that was my first exposure to history of science. Uh, series so in, in Antwerp, and so I, I Antwerp, 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 so uh, you know Antwerp. where it is. So there, I was completely shocked because I mean every historian I mean came up and said I like the history of science that was done around me. Came up and, here, here are my archives. I mean here's what I can conclude. And it was a time of extreme, extreme empiricism about I mean the conclusions that historians were licensed to present on the basis of the, their evidence. And I was shocked because for me history was a, a more ambitious uh, field. But then over time, I mean what I have seen is that historians have become more and more ambitious about, about the grand narratives. Again, I mean just think of Lorraine Daston, I mean do, doing this book on rules throughout the history of the Western world. So well, that's super ambitious. It's like a, a collection of case studies uh, built up into a, a history of, of the general concept of rule. And well, it's up to the historians to decide how they do the thing. But if they want to override the archive and say, well, even if I don't find the smoking gun, there's a bias there, they should know the um, they are not being exactly an empiric exactly empiricist. They are doing something that admits philosophical contestation. Because then the question is, so what do you take this bias to be? And the historians are, I know when I deal with don't want to engage in this debate. Because the, 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 the comfort of the convenience of being an empiricist is that you can dispense with philosophy. But if you want to get into what I think you're getting, I mean, you need very, very serious hypotheses as to how people they make, how people make their decisions, how their mind works, how their bias operate. And if you want to call them sexist or racist or any bias you can think of, I mean, you should do this on the basis of structural explanations that cannot be inferred directly from the archive. Sure, some of them, some of them not, but. Um I, do you, all, you still have a more an empirical option, which is shifting uh, sort of what you're explaining and going to other alternative archives and, and, and seeing sort of the, the contenders of, of alternative ways of creating archives of the moment of creating science and seeing, well, sort of there will be always a, 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 a process of extrapolation. I think that the smoking gun will never be able to be found. but. I think if, if, if you plunge, then that's my hypothesis, I'm not working with the archive, but my hypothesis is if you plunge into the archive of an, a committee, that if you see enough that you eventually will see some of those bias at play, and that there will be always sort of extrapolations and you always have to... Yeah, but as Yolid was saying, then you need then to systematize I mean, your analysis of mm -hmm. these records and say, well, look, I, I am I'm observing here a pattern. And then you are moving into a line of thinking that historians haven't liked so much this far. Like to be too empiricist, you mean? Yeah, no, in the sense that, I mean, historians have this obsession with the case. This is a singular case. I mean, they try to present each case on its own merit. If you want to detect biases the way you're suggesting, what you need to show is that there's a pattern. And the pattern involves comparison between cases. And this comparison between cases is, uh, goes against this obsession with the individuality. And I am all for this. And I, want, I would support you if you wanted to do this. But you try, I mean, my experience of trying to, I've published reasonably in the history of science, I mean, persuading reviewers ends up, ends up always in, a, in this sort of shit. Like, okay, <laughs> I, so either we take the archive as a 
testing ground or we don't. If we take the, the IGF as a testing ground, I mean, this is all the evidence we have. If you have something else, you put it on the table, please. Otherwise, I mean, we don't know what we... And this has happened to me time and again. But my problem is that I, I'm going to use my own example. Please, please, please. I'm looking at, at archives of the European Commission on the regulation of four seats. Yes. From the 1950s to, to the late 1990s. Um, and so if you look at it, it's mostly very technical discussions on, on um, jurisdictional aspects, legal aspects, and scientific aspects. And, and it, it sort of, if you read it, you can read this as a history of progress from, oh, we were not really sure how to regulate trade and, and how to sort of make classifications of seeds, and now we do. And sort of it's just a technocratic win through and through. And I, I, I'm, I'm, and that's what you see in the archives. Empirically, that's the only thing I can, that the archives is really telling me. That I know this is not, cannot be the case. That need, there needs to be something else. But and and my, my, my question is like, either the archive is, is corrupt, the archive is not showing some of the stuff that they were going in people's mind, because there's really so many filters from the person's head to, to, to what I find. But another option is would be to, to look at another archive that is not the European Commission archive, that is the archive of some... The private correspondence. Private of correspondence, no, but even... even, even um, uh, sort of, let's say, an archivist, an, an, an activist archive of an activist organization, and saying actually there were other ways of regulating this, and and there it's more of a comparison case, like okay, well we have these people who do things in in very sort of bureaucratized way, very European Commission style, but we also have people who sort of deal with forest seeds in very different ways, and just at least you show that the alternative was there and that. We don't know how, but they chose to ignore it, the people in the commission. Of course, we, don't, so we, we just won't find sometimes the evidence of, of, of why. Um, but, but I feel like this um, comparative approach is maybe a way of... And, and you, you, that's what you did. We teach what I did, yeah. Um, that's but a, I feel like that, that's but, the only way. But, and, and I'm with you, but for this stuff, I mean, you always have the possibility of an oral history. Yeah, and so you it can has its own, its own problems. Yeah, it, it has, but what I'm saying is that for such a recent case, I mean, there are other sources. Whereas for these sort of cases, it's all said and done. I mm -hmm. mean, we cannot interview anybody. We cannot find any more evidence. I mean, the, the interpretation yeah. is based on whatever you have on the table. So... The I mean, oral history is beautiful, but I'm not sure it delivers, and I don't think it aims to deliver on the empiricist quest. Because I think oral historians are really aware that, that they are dealing with people's account of the past, which, yeah, no, which, is, really bad, yeah, yeah. which is really bad at telling what things, how things happened. Um, but I, at least all oral historians, they are very aware of, of that their technique is not about bringing data of what happened in the past, but it's about looking at how people recollect the past, which is something else. Okay. But I feel like historians of science, we're not really good at um, sort of accepting that, that our archives are just, that we need to fill the gaps in any way. Well, that's a, uh, that's a, a professional controversy that I've, okay. been, I've been following in a number of outlets. Uh, and I think it's a generational uh, matter, I mean, it's your generation who we decide. <laughs> no, it's just not a beer. No, 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 no. It's a generational thing in the sense that uh -huh. I mean, so I mean, the people, I mean, I mean, the the people I knew twenty five years ago here did that sort of textual history, and that was completely uh, incompatible with this oral. Uh, I mean, but. Once, I mean, you find a new cohort of scholars who are gathering all this material and classifying it in a systematic manner and present it uh, uh, in a, an articulated argument, I mean, my older colleagues wouldn't be able to resist it. To resist it. So because they would think that it's not empirical enough? Because, I mean, I think that 
Shall we record all these? Yeah, because we, 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 <laughs> I'm gonna start. I'm sorry, who is Sam? <laughs> but but let, sh shall shall we close it more formally just to yes for the, so I mean before we go into the the drinks, uh, it's my time to thank you for. Um, this wonderful opportunity to revive my past in one and F and to yes. be here small with you again as a small but committed audience <laughs> and I'm very happy to be here and thank you all and thank you Use. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Let's clap for <laughs>